Hello and welcome to Improving Scottish Football. My name is Kieran, and today on the podcast I've got Greg McEwen. So Greg has had a really interesting career. Recently he was the commercial director at Hibs, and he was also the interim CEO there under Ron Gordon. So we're going to talk about his time at Hibs and what he tried to do differently. And we're also going to talk about how clubs can try and make themselves stand out in quite a competitive market. And we're going to look at some example clubs who are being brave and bold in how they do things. We're also then going to talk about strategy. This is something we've touched on in past episodes, but every organisation, let alone every football club, should have some sort of strategy or mission statement. In football, this is extra important because you've got thousands and thousands of fans who are paying good money to support their clubs. And for me, fans deserve to know what direction their club is taking and ultimately what their club is aiming to be. And if you look at some of the most progressive clubs in Europe, you know, your Red Bull Salzburgs, your Copenhagens, you will find their strategies clearly posted. So if we take Copenhagen as an example, on their website, they have got strategic goals of participating in the Champions League every second year on average. And if they're not in the Champions League, they want to be in the group stage of the Europa League. And they also are aiming for £80 million worth of commercial turnover by 2027. And a whole host of other things. But what's quite nice about that is that the whole club is clearly pulling in that same direction and all fans know where that club is trying to get to. Do Scottish clubs have their strategies and mission statements clearly signposted? The answer I will reveal later in the show. The good news is it is more than zero. I'll say that much. (laughs) So please subscribe to the podcast. Please tell your friends and colleagues, help spread the word about it and hit that five star review button on your podcast app. Go on, do it right now. Five stars. You know you want to. Let's keep this going. Let's improve Scottish football. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Greg McEwen. Greg, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Kieran. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. First of all, can we can we kick this off by you giving us a, a little bit of an introduction to yourself and obviously your connection to Scottish football? Of course. Um, so, as you said, I'm Greg McEwen, um, and probably like the vast majority of your listeners, um, been brought up with the sport of football, um, brought up in a mining village uh, in Fife called Carden Den, um, brought up watching junior football, um, the mighty Dundonald Bluebell um, back in the day, um, travelled the country watching them in various junior grounds across Scotland, and then when I was old enough, started going to Wraith Rovers, watching them, and then ultimately through my professional career, I've worked on World Cups, European Championships, I've worked on um, sponsorship of the Scottish Cup, National Team League Cup, um, and then found my way into the football clubs themselves when I spent uh, three years at Hibernian um, and a three-year spell at Hibernian with three different titles of Head of Marketing and Brand Partnerships, Interim CEO and finally the Commercial Director. So so yeah, I've never been far from the, the game of football as a fan, um, as a participant and then uh, professionally as well. Nice. And uh, so, well, let's kick off with Hibs then. What was it like to work there? It was great. Um, Hibs, as I've mentioned, I've always been a football fan um, and been just over the other side of the water. Um, Easter Road actually gave me one of the best experiences that I had as a football fan when uh, and I used to wind up some of the staff on this with during my time at Hibs. That it wasn't a Hibs game. It was when Wraith Rovers played Bayern Munich in the UEFA Cup. Uh-huh. Um, and it was played at Easter Road. Um, what a fantastic night that was. But like, I worked in the world of golf and then it was going to take a big opportunity to to take me away from that. And um, the opportunity came to go into Hibernian with the, the late Ron Gordon. Um, and it was always a club that I looked at as being a very well-run club. Um, one of the, the top four or five clubs in the country. Phenomenal opportunity. Um, to try and do something different 
um, based in the city of Edinburgh. It had so much going for it, and um, still does. Um, so it, it was great to be able to go in and, and play a part in the, the club's history in that sense. Nice. You said uh, do something different. Um, what what did you try and do differently? What did you try and look to change when you were there? Um, great question. And I think during the whole interview process, uh, I should probably say that, that, that there was two roles going at the time and I, I said that I needed them both for it to be the opportunity that I wanted it to be and the directors that interviewed me and then, as I say, Ron was the final interview and he totally bought into what I was hoping to achieve. And having been around football and worked with football clubs from the outside, so from the sponsorship side on League Cups and Leagues and things like that, a lot of clubs do pretty much the same things. Um, and I'm not being critical because I, I get it, having been in the game, that a lot of it is playing safe. Um, so it, you, you can't control what happens on the pitch on a Saturday, absolutely not but from a business perspective it becomes quite cyclable in terms of season ticket campaigns kit launches, hospitality sales half season tickets um, like various different things that every fan will be more than aware of but I wanted to try and be brave um, I wanted to give the Hibs supporters something that they could be proud of um, as well as just a team on the park on the Saturday. Um, it was what what is the mission of the club? What are the values of the club? How do we bring everybody closer to the club so that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet? Um, create that togetherness. Like You would have heard this a million times, but I think you'd be very hard pushed to find a successful f- football team that hasn't had a really tight dressing room. Mm-hmm. So why, why couldn't we replicate that as a club and bring sponsors, fans, former players, all on that same journey. And I just thought that would be such a powerful movement um, to try and create. Um, so like one of the first things, the first campaign, I'm sure it was the first campaign, season ticket campaign, I had put it to Ron and he was like, if you believe in it, then let's do it. So we went with, this is our city. Um, clearly a city of division. Um not as strong as what it is in the West, but it's a, a friendlier rivalry and more banter-led, probably. Um, and yeah, I had to put the tin hat on for a while with some of the, <laughs> uh, the social media comments that came back from that. But but it gave the Hibs fans the opportunity to puff out the chest and go, you're right, this is our city. And we followed it up with a kit launch that had the street map of Edinburgh on it. And it was all integrated and it was all part of a bigger plan. And you started to sense that there was more pride coming out um, of the fan base at that point. We worked really closely with uh, fan podcast groups, um, ex-players, and bringing everybody into the club, welcoming them, um, because they've all got part of the the club's history. And I always looked at that I was nothing other than a custodian of the club. Um, The club's going to be there for many, many years, and I just wanted to do the job to the best of my ability during my time to hopefully progress it a bit and then whoever comes in progresses it even further and the club keeps moving forward. That's that's the way that I've been brought up. I'm not one of these that wants to go in and set a bar that high that nobody can achieve and like the club then stunts its progression. You want the club to, to be doing well. I still go along with my little boy, my daughter, my wife um, and cheer the boys on because you make, you make friendships through it. Um, but yeah, in terms of doing things differently, that was what I tried to do was to, to be a little bit more edgier um, be a bit more brave, bold, even kit designs. Like just try and like test and learn. Don't don't be scared of failure. Um, as I say, I just felt as though there was a part of Scottish football that just played safe too often, and we needed something to try and move the narrative a little bit. Yeah, and you also were. Did you look after the Thank You NHS sponsorship? Yeah, yeah that's right. So that was the. So I started in December twenty nineteen. Obviously, the pandemic was the, the following March, um, which was a great welcome to the game. Um, massive challenge. And at that point, I was in discussions with a number of commercial partners for the, the front of shirt sponsorship. And understandably, when the pandemic struck, everybody was just locking down, uh, battening down the hatches and not spending money because nobody knew what it meant, what it was going to look like. Um so we managed to come up with the idea of putting Thank You NHS on the, the front of the shirt. Um, 
we did a few things in the background, which meant that it never cost us as much financially. Um, a few, a few people contributed um, to the idea, um, which meant that it wasn't a complete loss um, financially. Um, but the bigger play was the, like, the brand growth that we got in the back of that. Like when we launched that, it went to parts of the world that we could only have dreamed about going to. So very quickly Hibernian became the the second club for a number of people for making that gesture. Um, I think I'm right in saying this, that we were the only club in the UK, or certainly the first, that put it on the front of the shirt. I think there was a few that followed up putting it on the sleeve, but I don't think anybody ever put it on the front. Mm. Um, but like, Hibs have got a a number of really well-known fans, and then you've got the likes of Andy Murray tweeting about it and putting it on uh, Facebook and uh, X, as it's now known, and You've got Dan Walker, the match of the day presenter and things, tweeting about it that like, it was just phenomenal reach um, that it gave the club. And it was a fantastic gesture. And it, it wasn't just a, a branding exercise either. There was a lot of depth to that. We worked really closely with the NHS Lothian. We've done a number of different activities during the course of the year. Um, we had an NHS day where we invited all the, the nurses and the staff and the doctors um, to a game. Um, so there's about 1,500 um, came to the game that day. Um, so, yeah, it was just trying to do our bit. Um, Hibs are known as a community club um, and Pair Easter Road's based. It's one of the most densely populated areas of Europe, never mind Edinburgh. So mm. loads of different languages there. So it's just nice to be able to give back because you, you've got a responsibility to your own community um, and we were very understanding of the situation at the time. And yes, there was the badging exercise and the brand opportunity, but equally it was the right thing to do. Yeah. And while we're on the subject of sponsorship, um, at the time of recording, the SPFL is currently without a title sponsor going into next season. Do you have any thoughts on that? Obviously it's not an easy, an easy fix. You know, there is a lot of work that has to go on behind the scenes. Is there a case for, us seeking to be bolder to maybe think a little bit outside the box and maybe there could be for instance a partner out there who might not offer as much money but maybe could um could open up doors in terms of giving us um bigger appeal or allowing more people around the world to to see our football yeah you've sort of got two things there i think kieran um first of all obviously there's been change within the the setup um, of how these things are done now within the, the SPFL or the SFA. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, Brendan Napier, now in there with the, the challenge of bringing in said sponsor. Um, so I wish him all the best in that <laughs> role. Um, as you say, it's not a it's not an easy task. Um, trying to get sponsorships at club level isn't easy, so never mind the, uh, the, the top table with the, the rights holder. However, I do think that you, you touched on it, that there is an opportunity to be creative um, and to be different. Um, and it's going to need to take something brave to make that change. Again, I talked about how when I went to Hibernian and it was a lot of clubs were doing it safely. Um, obviously, the, the majority of the money out there at the moment will be in gambling sectors. Um, but I'm sure that the guys at the SPFL will be looking at the values of the organisation and where do they want to take the money from um, to protect, uh, protect, protect sorry, the, the values of the game and the fans and the clubs and everything that goes with it and the integrities uh, of the game. Um, so they will be looking outside the box in terms of sponsorships. However, is there a way where is it you do some analysis, is it the top figure that's scaring people away? Um, is it then easier to maybe break the season down into two sections first six months, second six months and you split it and therefore you're not asking for as much revenue do you do it as quarters Like, how, how do you want to look at it, do you do a different tiered structure um, with title and various uh, secondary partners um, all of that I am assuming will be looked at um, because it's not the, the one size fits all anymore Um and if it is that top figure that we're not getting to because people are deeming it too rich, then how can we decide to cut the cake up that allows us to get to that top number but doing it in a, a tactical and different manner to what we have done in the past? 
Um, I think the the second part of what you you mentioned in terms of getting more people to see the game that then brings in the broadcast rights, which is then secondary, um, which is obviously always a a very topical debate when uh, yeah, isn't it just the broadcast rights gets done and should it be on uh, like terrestrial TV? Is it on pay TV? And like, you've got so many different streaming products now. Um, You've got so many different territories across the globe. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a lot to be taken into account when it comes to that as well. Um, obviously, I don't think that's going to come up for a few years now in the back of the, the last deal, but there's probably still ways that that deal can be looked at and derogated and seen if there's any way that any of it can be split out to then maybe package something up to put it out to somebody else. Um I'm a great believer in where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in partnerships. So yeah. in the spirit of a partnership, as long as you're protecting your partners, which absolutely you do, but if you, you share a, a bigger picture, then there should be something that's able to be done. Yeah, I agree. I share that sentiment where there's a will, there's a way. My yeah. big question is, is there a will? <laughs> hey, that's a very fair question. Very so, fair question. Um... But I mean, the way I look at it now, I mean, I you know, the, the new deal is going to be kicking in very um, well, uh, starting starting next season. We've basically got until twenty twenty nine uh, when it ends to really, uh, yes, obviously there might be uh, things that we can that we can do you know, during that time, but broadly we've got you know four years, give or take three four years, to really get our house in order. I think you know, to really nail our product. And when when the, when the uh, renewal is up or when we're seeking a new partner, we really do need to get ourselves overall in, in a better space, in a stronger space where we can at least um, have a, have a bit of a, have a bit of a bidding war or have some, some more options, but yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about um, match day experience. Cause I know this is an area you're, you're quite passionate about. Talk to me a little bit about um, where you would love to see Scottish football get to. Because I, again, it's not just you, but a lot of us in Scotland have have an issue with the um, the fact that fans are brought in for the match. You know, sit and watch ninety minutes, and then are, you know, then leave the stadium, and and that's pretty much it. But there's so many more opportunities there. Tell us a little bit about your perspective on that. Yeah, um, I've got so many in here, but the, the, the first thing I'll say to try and give a, a, a wider scope to it, <clears throat> like Scottish football, as you've just said, it's you turn up five to three. Um, if you're there with your mates, you're going for a pint before it, you're leaving the pub, probably even half a pint in your tumbler, and then getting along, having a queue at the turnstiles to then get in, into your seat, watching the game, and then back out again. Um, depending on how the results go, and you might even leave early. Um, so, um, it, it's just you're you're in and out, in effect. Um, however, you look at this time of year and what we've experienced last weekend—not uh, that weekend there, but the weekend before—and then what we'll experience next weekend will be that Edinburgh becomes a massive sporting city because of the Six Nations, and the Six Nations is an all-day event. Um, so turnstiles open two and a half hours before kickoff, two hours before kickoff, depending on kickoff time is. You can watch the earlier game if there's an early game. You then go and watch your own game. Then you can watch the game after it if there's a game after it. It is a full day of entertainment, um, and there'll be bands on, there'll be eateries, there'll be bars. But yet there is an absolute split of how rugby is treated in this country and how football is treated in this country. Um, so that would be the first thing. Um, so that is where I absolutely feel for Scottish football in general that it is treated in a completely different way to how rugby is. And the bizarre thing being that rugby is not segregated. You could be sitting next to your rival fans, whilst in football you're treated like animals and it's like you have to sit over there and we'll sit over there. Mm. And we create division, we create the hostile environment by doing that. Um, so very, 
I, I just think that something needs to be done. There needs to be research done into it, and it's long overdue. And I was a big believer in the pandemic being the opportunity that we should have been able to trial changing that narrative in football. When you weren't allowed away fans at grounds, what is to stop the home fans, of which you're only getting 25% capacities, being able to enjoy a beer in the concourses, even trial it that's in the concourses and not in the seating deck, however you wanted to do it but trial it. If fans can't behave in that environment, absolutely, football shot itself in the foot. But there was an absolute opportunity there to trial it. Yeah. So I think that, that that's the, the first frustration I have is how different sports are treated um, from the top level, from government level, um, and what needs to change to change the not just the fan experience, but the commercials for football clubs as well, which in turn allows them to buy hopefully better quality players to make the product better on the pitch on a Saturday. Um, so it just goes in a cycle. Um, so that's from a top level. Um, from a club level, um, hopefully all the listeners, anybody that's been Easter Road over the last two or three years will see that there's been a marked difference in the the the. the presentation or the production, if you like, of the, the game. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, the late Ron Gordon hired me at Hibernian and being American, being a big sports fan, there is nobody that does sport quite like the, the Americans in terms of a fan experience, um, whether it's baseball, um, basketball, whatever, um, you really get immersed in the, the sport. So Ron wanted to digitise the stadium um, as well as monetizing these areas I think the big screens in my opinion big screens fantastic to add into the stadium environment um, not really a revenue generator they are very much a, a fan engagement play you can put up some really good hype videos and player content fan content um, and just immerse them in the uh, the stories, if you like, whether yeah. it's community, women, men, and, and don't uh, and and don't forget, you know, it also gives you a great opportunity opportunity to have VAR checking yeah, yeah, on the, on the screen yeah. for a good four or five minutes before they make a call as well. Tell you what, if you can get a sponsor for VAR, they're getting a great uh, <laughs> a great amount of time on the screens. Um, so so yeah, um, that's where the screens work. Then obviously LEDs they make sense. The the days of just a a static perimeter board for a couple of grand behind the goals. Um, if you can add in the animation and the, the full um, 270, um, it, it really does bring the, the stadium to life. And new PA system, um, changed up the hospitality suites, um, which are tremendous. Um, and I, I think at the time of doing it, it was leading the way in Scottish football in terms of how football was done. When we were discussing it uh, back then, I, I was pushing that if you were to phone a restaurant right now and book a table for two for you and your partner, you'd expect a, t a table of two. But when you were going to the football and you were phoning for a table of two, you could have been sitting at a table of ten with eight strangers who may well be the really nice, the, the best nice, uh, best eight people you've ever met in your life. Or it might be a stag do that's on an absolute rowdy one that <laughs> ruins your experience. You just pull up. Um, so that had to change. You, you had to get what you booked. Um, so the, the days of the round tables of 10 and things like that were, were coming to an end it had already progressed down south it needed to change up here um, and now the, the various different rooms that you've got at Easter Road from the entry level of the, the Albion Bar where you can come in with your mates for a pint watch the early kick off go to your seat and that, that's made a difference um, and it's, it's really caught the, the imagination of the fans I, I believe I've seen last week there already looking at phase two, which is another version of that in the, the North Stand, all the way up to the, the top level Emerald Club, um, which brings your highest uh, spenders, if you like, in terms of the, the table spend, um, and you're sitting in the director's box, and that really gives them a almost an associate director role at the club where they're getting right close to the, the directors and the, the goings on behind the scenes. So they yeah. gave them a level of integration that they never had before. So I know that we were speaking uh, before, Kieran, that at the time of going to the club, like you, you look at what clubs do you learn from and who, who can you take things from? And again, growing up as a football fan, I used to always be amazed at how Borussia Dortmund operated as a club. Um, mm -hmm. And the the engagement between their fans and the players and the club 
like everybody was properly aligned um and I wanted to try and replicate areas of that um and I still speak to some ex players now that have departed and they very nice of them to say but they're, they're saying things like I've never felt so close to the club apart from being a player um as I did when you worked at the club because we were welcomed in all the time we had the Hibs TV during the pandemic we had them in the lounges we had them at Q&A nights we had them at partner nights um, and th it made them feel like they were still part of the club but they'll always be part of the club in my opinion and that's why you need to embrace it all clubs do um, the, these players past and present have played a massive part in growing the fan base and giving fans heroes and cult heroes um, over their time so like bringing guys like Russell Latape onto Hibs TV during the pandemic by a satellite link or zoom or whatever we used back then was hilarious and um, that he's been a like co-presenter in the games at easter road and he's lying on his hammock in barbados it was <laughs> just hilarious but it was you had, you had to try these things and the fans loved it yeah um and yeah it's a mixture of what borussia dortmund were doing in that aspect and then over the water you've got a club like bohemians who they sort of from a probably more from a commercial standpoint going back to what I was talking about earlier and uh, looking to do things a bit differently and be bold they they caught my attention when they were doing things like the Bob Marley kit um, that they did a few years back um, and basically that was in honour of a, a gig that Bob Marley had done at their, their ground and that was where I started to think that kit designs need to be different um, it can't be predictable um, and to be honest one of the kits that we did I was engaged with a couple of guys in America and we were, well, basically had an agreement with Macklemore, um, who had like 40 odd million followers um, on social media that he was going to help us with one of our kits. Um, but then I, I know that I'm going to, the irony in this is I'm saying that you have to be bold and then I balked at that um, simply because I thought it was a step too far too quickly. Um, so I pulled it back and we'd done a partnership with the Proclaimers, which was a, a better fit, um, a little bit safer, but still taking us out of the, the norm. Um, and then we did the yellow Sunshine on Leaf kit with the lyrics of Sunshine on Leaf through the kit, um, which went on to be a, a great seller. But um, you look at the, what the likes of Arsenal are doing now and uh, Venezia have sort of played a key part in the, the fashion ranges that clubs are now doing. Um, mm -hmm. That's a, an area that I get really interested in when it comes to the kit design stages of the year. Um, but yeah, that was a long-winded answer, Kieran, of uh, what I was trying to do when I was at Hibs. But, but yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I would like to think that I've played a little part in uh, bringing the fans and things closer to it all. Yeah. Well, I actually had the pleasure of um, going to the Emerald Hospitality uh, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, pretty and, good. And uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Good. Honestly, superb food. And as you say, we went outside and were sat literally right next to the directors in padded seats. Yeah. And it's funny because when I got invited to the hospitality, I'm not a Hibs fan, but when I got invited, yeah. uh, thank you, Graham. I honestly just assumed it would be a table of 10, you know, um, and that I'd be in with a bunch of other kind of random people. But actually, we were just on a table of four and it was just just a brilliant experience and i'm sure it would rival anything that's um that's down south yeah i, I don't think there's a i don't think there's an offering like that in scottish football at the moment yeah. um because it, as you would have seen it's a, an intimate room 10 tables only yeah um 10 tables of four and it's part of the package that these table owners receive as they get their own exclusive golf day um, as well as the, the match day experience so um, the exclusive golf day has been at the renaissance the last couple of years which isn't too bad nice yeah and we just need to work out a way of obviously that's obviously for the higher spenders you know yeah. collectively as you know you know fans of Scottish football we need to work out a way of making sure that fans of all levels um, find a better way to totally. experience the and, match day I think to counter that um, I mentioned Albion Bar I, I truly believe that the, the value that the Albion Bar members have, and it'd be great if any of them could let you know what they think if they're listening. You, you tend to have, well, they're all regular, but they've all got their little areas where they go and sit and have their pint before the game and things. 
But the players walk through that lounge and these guys are the entry level, which basically works out about a tenner a game. Um, and the amount of selfies and pictures that you see of these fans with the players week in, week out, and they're building up a rapport with the players. Mm. Um, so for, from a an entry level product perspective, as I say, it works out about a tenner a game. Um, it's a fantastic bar and everybody goes in there after it. Um, I respect to be put lounge that they're in and it's got a really good atmosphere to it. But you might be even sampled out on your way out as well when you were a... Um, yeah, the, the evening did become a bit of a blur. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, right. So Greg, I want to kind of just um, come on to the idea and you mentioned it a little bit there about you know Dortmund about this idea of kind of having a mission statement and and a whole club being unified on you know a proper strategy and direction of travel because i think this is something we fall down on a lot not only for individual clubs but i also think the SPFL as a whole you know in terms of where are we trying to go what are we trying to be now before we recorded you were telling me a little bit about the RNA because you were marketing manager there yeah. and you were telling me that they had a very clear defined mission statement. Do you mind telling me a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, first of all, I, I totally agree. I think it's really important having that mission statement and, and core values and everybody needs to know their place within that. And when it, when it really hit home with me was when I worked at the RNA and we had the, um, very clear mission statement, which was to ensure that golf is still thriving for 50 years from now. So very short, very succinct. But then you had your core values and everybody then knew their role and how that could play into what the values in the core mission statement were. Um, so everybody was aligned, even though the difficulty that we had at the RNA was that... You, some people were frustrated because they deemed it as silos, but we were working in so many different buildings in St. Andrews. There wasn't a building that could accommodate all of the workforce. So we were sitting in five or six different buildings across the, the various streets. So it wasn't really conducive to working together on a, a daily basis and like working in tandem. However, we were absolutely aligned when it came to mission statements and values, which they encountered that. And every, everybody knew what their role was. And I think you're right. I think in the most part, I think Scottish football um, doesn't really have that. Um, whether it's at the top or whether it's at clubs, um, it would be interesting if you were to go around 10 members of staff at each of the top 12 clubs in Scotland and say, what's your mission statement and what's your values? How many different answers you would get? Yeah. Or what these, or, or even just what do you stand for? What, what do the clubs stand for? Um, I would assume that the most common one would be over a community club but then if you were to follow up and say well, what, what does that mean then it would lack the, the substance probably um, so I think there is absolutely a play there I think part of the reason that there's not is and again I understand it to an extent but the majority of clubs are very much focused on week after week after week it's very short term based um, all about the results in the pitch and securing safety or securing top six or securing a European spot or whatever it may be with these different challenges Yeah. rather than there's probably not enough people that are looking at the long term in terms of how that club is then going to be in 10, 15, 20, 25 years time because the club will still be there That that's absolutely no doubt the club will be there but in what state who knows but mm. that's how it is the responsibility of those at the top table just now at every club to protect the club's long-term vision rather than spending over and above the budgets to try and chase imminent success when it is no guarantee of coming. You have to live within your means, be sustainable and protect the, the long-term future of the club. Um, so by having that clear vision, clear mission statements and living by those, and if you go to an AGM and people start criticising results in the pitch, I'm sure that if you were to tell fans straight that, well, do you know what? We could spend an extra 200,000, 300,000, 500,000 pound on players, but it's not necessarily going to help us on pitch performance. So what would you rather short-term or to ensure that 
your kids and grandkids have got a club to kind of watch like what you have at the moment. I think the fans would probably want to make sure that the club was there in 10, 15, 20 years' time. Um, so as long as you're making decisions and you're watertight in the reasons why you're making the decisions, um, I, I think fans would very much sign up to that. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, all fans just want to know a little bit more about the strategic direction of their club yeah. because obviously clubs mean so much to us as fans and some clubs are quite good at it and are quite transparent and totally open about where the club is heading, etc. But then there's some clubs where the supporters are like, like what, are you, uh, what are you trying to do here? I'm going to just pick a, a recent example because the club's in a little bit of a wobble period, shall we say, but Celtic, you know, there's I've got a couple of fa um friends who are fans and there's just a, a you know a big question there on what is the board actually trying to achieve do they are they happy with just focusing on domestic on the domestic front or do they actually want to make an impact in Europe because uh, that's obviously what the fans want but the, <laughs> it's not actually clear from the board like what are they actually trying to do you know are they happy with where they are um so obviously we were talking a little bit about this before we recorded and I thought I would do a little bit of digging into this whole idea of a of a mission statement. And so I've actually been having a bit of a Google on what premiership clubs have a clear and obvious mission statement or strategy that is publicized clearly uh, on, on, on their website. Now, do you want to take a wild guess, Greg, on how many clubs in the premiership have got a, a clear and obvious mission statement. Out of the top 12. Um, in terms of having it on their website, I would say no more than three. You're correct. It's just one club. And for a bonus point, would you like to guess that would you like to guess the club? I've got two in my head. St. Johnson or Ross County. It's actually St. Mirren. Oh, close. But, but, but you were kind of right earlier. You were talking about the community clubs. Yeah. So their mission is, uh, well, it says, our mission is to be the best community-centred development football club in Scotland. Right? Really clear and concise. Everyone knows what they're trying to do. Um, honestly, I couldn't find anything... Yeah, uh, I, I, I might have missed it, but honestly, I had a really oh, good. But that doesn't really surprise Google. me. I'd imagine they'll all have it in house and not really publicising it. I but, think, but, but um, this is it. But fans, totally, what... totally communication, open and yeah. transparent communication, hundred percent, totally agree. Um, I think we are massive applauds to St. Man. They they've went out and done a lot of work with their fans uh, over the last twelve to eighteen months. Like the decisions on allocation, the tickets to um, the bigger sides and the games and things, and letting fans help make the decision, knowing what the consequences may look like. Um, so they they've been really open and transparent, um, which is refreshing. And I'm like, again, is it any coincidence that they're having a really good season? Who knows? Um, but pulling everybody in the same journey, the same direction on the same journey, it certainly plays a part in it. I think. Um, out with the top division, I think another one who announced it recently, um, I'm sure they put it out publicly, was Dunfermline. Mm. Um, so I think they went out recently about a couple of the key strategic um, areas that they're looking to develop. Um, so obviously another club who are under relatively new ownership. Um, but yeah, I'm sure that they put out their strategic plan recently. Um, yeah, on suit. yeah I, I just found the whole I just yeah, assumed yeah. every club would have, you know, something there. But um, yeah, I was, I was quite shocked. But yeah, kudos to St. Mirren. And to be fair, they've also got it, you know, it's a, in a big PDF on their website, really nice and clear. And, um, you know, gives you a real clear yeah. idea of, of what they're trying it's to what do. what you want as a fan. Exactly. Um, and, you know, the SPFL is another interesting one, you know, just from an, from an overall, you know, mission statement point of view. The SFA have got one. Um, the mission statement of, of the SFA is to uh, promote, foster, and develop the game at all levels in this country. Yep. So that's that's good for the SPFL. I yeah, it comes back to this whole, whole big question of like, what do we want to be? 
as as a footballing nation. You know, for me, if if I was to um, write something down, it would be we want to be a top ten league um, in in Europe. We want to play entertaining, uh, attractive football, and we want to bring through our young Scottish players. Those would be like some of the things that I would be thinking about. But, you know, I kind of, again, unless we write this down, if you were to ask, yeah. you know, any fan um, or or any club, what is Scottish football or, or what is the SPFL trying to do? Y- you would get lots of different answers. So You would. Um, and clearly in football, if you're trying to please everybody in football, then you, you absolutely need to stop working in football because that is absolutely mission impossible. Um, you will never ever please everybody. Um, yeah, it's. I, I think that there's definitely scope for being all of those that you say. Um, I think we could absolutely be a top ten league in Europe. And um, when you look at the the size of our nation, in comparison to the the Scandinavian countries and Belgiums and places like this, is there's no reason why we can't. Um, but we just yeah. seem to continually hold ourselves back. Um, and yeah, like right, there's a mixture of reasons why commercially, fan engagement, um, the amount of clubs that play. Um, like you talk about innovations. I used to have this conversation with Ron Gordon that Ron used to be surprised that we couldn't sell out Easter Road every week, um, 20,000 seater stadium. I was like, totally understand because we've got a big fan base. Um, you got a lot of international visitors um, to Edinburgh um, but the big thing that I kept on coming to again I'll go back to how I started off by talking about my background I'm a, I'm a fan I played and people tell you play as long as you can and um, when you think about the amount of football that gets played in this country between the hours of 12 and 5 on a Saturday that is actually the fans bullseye target of a a customer or a fan, um, however you want to look at it. So we we don't help ourselves by playing all the... Like, we're competing against ourselves, in effect. So have one day for participation, one day for going to watch, your professional clubs play. Um, like Look at how we set that up um, in terms of Friday nights. Right? There you had another great game on Friday night in the, the championship. Um, always got a good crowd you look at during the festive period people seem to be amazed that attendances will go up by 20% that's because we're not fighting against each other um, so it's like I don't think it's rocket science when you boil it all down how we then shape it up don't know um, I, I think we could certainly give it a go though but when you look at the amount of amateur football and junior football that gets played as well as your East of Scotland leagues, West of Scotland leagues um, like your lowland leagues, highland leagues, as well as the top four divisions, it is unbelievable the amount of football that gets played in Scotland on a Saturday afternoon. Mm. Um, so if you were to split that out in some way, you would see attendances shoot through the roof. You would see commercials at all the clubs shoot through the roof, become far more sustainable because of all of that, and you would then ultimately see a better product on the pitch because clubs are bringing in more money to then hopefully sign better quality players or mm. bring through better quality players stretch their academies, bring more people through the academies. Because there is a bit of a concern about the, the number of youth coming through at the moment in, in clubs. Um, Big time. We're having a purple patch with the national team at the moment. Um, but it's you're always looking at the what's next. Um, so we need to make sure that we keep that conveyor belt going. Absolutely. Um, Greg, this has been uh, great. Thank you. Um, but before I let you go, I'm going to ask the question I ask every guest, which is, if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing about Scottish football, what would it be? Um, you did throw this on me, so I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually going to take two, uh, if that's okay, Kieran. Um, I'll go back to when I was a kid. I actually loved it when it was a 16-team league. Um, and I get a little bit envious when I watch like the EPL and the Championship. Uh, south of the border where you're only playing home and away once um, and it just seems to be a better spectacle I'm not saying it's boredom up here but it's just very repetitive that 
you could like there the Hibs have got a double header coming up against Ross County in a couple of weeks' time. And then depending where they finish in the top six, bottom six, you could be playing three times in the space of two months. Um so it just becomes repetitive. So when you're commercially looking at trying to get bums on seats and new experiences, you're not really helping yourself. You're not letting people experience different stadiums or anything else. So I think we restrict ourselves there. And I do think that the reason, well, I think we're all knowing the reason why it's a League of Ten and it's because the broadcast deal wants the four Celtic Rangers games. Um, however, again, Scottish football shouldn't sell on the foot because I don't think that's helping the narrative in Scottish football at the moment. With no away fans at these matches, it becomes a terrible TV spectacle, in my opinion. Um, so I, I think that all needs to be looked at. But ultimately, a 16-team league, I think, would be a great way to, to go back to and uh, help drive change and bring in more clubs through and more youngsters through and uh, taking a bit more pressure off that way. But So that's one. Um, and secondly, tied into that, uh, I'd love to see even just there has to be a minimum number of Scots in a, a squad on a match day um, because of that fear that I mentioned earlier that I think that we're starting to lose the the better talent in our country um, because they're not getting a chance. Um, we're bringing in like the like same age, relatively same talent on bigger money probably um, than what our own crop of youngsters have got. Um, and I'll go back to my time at Hibs and I admire Jack, uh, Jack Ross, who loved working with Jack and um, think he's a fantastic man, fantastic manager, great coach. Um, he refused to spend wildly on foreign talent because he wanted homegrown um, and at worst British because they understand the game. And I don't think there's any coincidence that that's why we had a great season and finished third that year. Um, they brought people into the game that knew the game. Um, so I think we could certainly help ourselves by bringing in more talent. Brilliant. Well, two very good answers there. Thank you, Greg. Uh, no great. Problem. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, really appreciate you giving up your time. Thank you for having me. And a big thank you to everyone who is listening. This podcast was produced by Edinburgh Documentary Films, which is a film and media company co-founded by me, Kieran Hennigan. So we make documentaries for TV and cinema, but we also work with companies and brands to help them tell their stories in impactful and meaningful ways. You can find out more at edinburghdocs.co.uk and please contact me directly if you'd like to talk about any potential projects. <laughs>